This is Live Well Talk on teething, first foods and introducing solids. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at UnityPoint Health, St. Luke's Hospital. As a new parent, the first year is full of mystery. It is difficult to know when your child is ready for solid food or if they are teething. To shed some light on these mysteries is UnityPoint Clinic pediatrician, Dr. Luke Spellman. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm, I'm always nervous about these podcasts, which I have no idea about the topic. So so I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the student here. What, what, are, what, what is teething? I mean, you know, there's a lot of superstition with this and myths and uh you know uh, i can remember back when my daughters were quote teething in quote um and uh you know I, I think we were given advice that was from one side of the family was to do this and the absolute opposite advice from the other side other grandparents and just said we didn't really do anything so what is teething so i i think of teething as basically the normal progression that babies go through when they when they're they're going to eventually um start to basically have tooth eruption. So it typically is an entity that you start to see around, you know, four months of age, and it's a general di intermittent discomfort they get, um, which varies greatly. And again, it's every, every baby's a little different, but it's a, a normal progression that uh, babies go through as their teeth are coming in. As, as, a, as a parent, what, what, what should I, how should I handle that? I remember I had one uncle that told me to stick my thumb in bourbon and then rub it on the gums of my infant. I, you know, uh, being a trained health professional, I, that didn't sound like the right thing to do, so I didn't. But you can imagine the kind of advice that's out there. I mean, what, what should I, as a parent, what should I do? So there's, there's a lot of advice out there, and there's a lot of different home remedies out there and, and some other, you know, So you don't recommend bourbon around. for infants? So, I, it, you know, it... it it might have worked, <laughs> but it's not recommended. Okay, all right. Just, uh, but guess it probably worked back back yeah, in the day. Yeah. <laughs> so typically, it's it's not a general base, you know, mainstream recommendation now. But we laugh about that a lot too. But uh, so so typically, you know, there's a variety of things, uh, you know, that you can look at and and do with teething. But you know, there there are some things out there that you do want to avoid that that are pushed in society. Um, and I don't, would you like me to speak yeah, about a couple of those right now? So, so like we've really fallen away and gone away from like the aura gel and the uh, numbing uh, gumming uh, gels. Uh, the, the risk of those that we worry about babies getting a little too much of that and swallowing and affecting uh, numbing the, the back of their mouth and into their throat and affecting their swallowing. Uh, the other thing that things that are out there, the teething tablets, we generally uh, go away from that recommendation too. Uh, those have belladonna in them and they're, they're, they're really, you know, they're, that, that, that is truly a medication that a baby probably shouldn't have. Um, so really with teething, a lot of it is reassurance, you know, understanding that their babies are going to have some little intermittent times of irritability, distinguishing that from, um, you know, potentially a more serious illness and then doing just some general things to help. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, like healthychildren.org, which is through the AAP, they, they give some good recommendations, which include, you know, um, cooling a, 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 a cloth uh, so they can gum on that and then some, some teething toys too. Now, for my knowledge, I, wh at what age do you start to give the infant solid food? So, so typically with solid, solid food, it can vary and people do it at different times. I think a good cutoff to think about is no earlier than four months of age. Okay. So, and I think you have to take, take look at the individual baby too. So if the baby's uh, premature or earlier, you really want to do their corrected age. So if they're a couple weeks early, you want to wait a couple extra weeks. And, and really there's not necessarily a rush, but most, most babies between four and six months of age is when you talk about introduction. Of food. So they're so they're not to be Captain Obvious here, but they're 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 teething just about the time they're going to start solid food. Yep. And so that does that influence solid food selection? So so I think I think it's a correlation, and I and I think that's it's probably a good thing because they're they're going to be they're 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 the baby will want to be gumming things and working things in their mouth. Um, so it so it early on with specific food selection, you want to basically you know give the baby anything that's easy to swallow. So nothing that really has large chunks in it. That's, that's one of the biggest, biggest things to look at with, with uh, what, you re what you give the baby. And then the teething process, the gumming is gonna help, you know, break that food down too. And it's hopefully gonna help them figure out their oral moral reflex. So how they swallow, how they gum it, and then swallow the food. Are there certain, so the food with chunks would be avoided? Is there anything else that should be avoided? So 
there have been some more recent guidelines. Uh, in 2017, they looked at like uh, egg and peanut allergies. And my recommendation for that would be to talk to your pediatrician or your family doctor, your primary care physician, about how they want to handle introduction of that. It's pretty specific relative to you know other associated um, uh, things like if the baby has eczema and things like that. We used to recommendation for avoidance of like peanuts and um, eggs used to be two to three years of age. But what they're what they are finding is early introduction of that earlier introdu introduction might might help uh, decrease the risk of allergy. But it, it gets pretty specific. So in general, a good rule of thumb is nothing that the baby could swallow, nothing it can swallow and get stuck in you know their um, you know where they could choke. So you know, more pureed fruit foods, like baby type consistency, like baby foods that you buy, um, or if you make your own baby foods. But there's not a big restriction now. I would just say for some specific things like peanuts, eggs, just get a game plan with your pediatrician. Okay. Um, what about, how does, uh, whether it's breast or formula, factor into this, if it does at all? And how, when does that transition take place typically to, to uh, bottle milk? So, you know, really introduction of foods, uh, I, I would say breast breast fed uh, babies or formula fed babies, typical introduction of foods between four to six months or around four to six months is, is pretty consistent with both of those. Again, I think it's individual for when the baby shows when it's ready to start baby uh, some foods. Uh, I found in my experience that a lot of breastfed babies are very particular and they really like to be breastfed. So, so I think you might have some babies that you know are very particular in when they you know what they want when they want it. Um, and then as far as transitioning to uh, like a whole milk, which is recommended until two years of age, that's typically I'm pretty hard line about 12 months. So 12 months is the recommendation to transition to that from formula to breast or breast to, to whole milk. But you can you know basically formula to whole milk 12 months, and then if some people choose to breastfeed longer uh, than 12 months, that's fine too. The Whole milk, that's for, so they had the fat for brain development, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep, that's like a thought. vitamin D. Yeah. Whole okay. milk. Yep, A and Makes D whole sense. milk. Yep. All right. There are people are listening, and here's the, here's the million-dollar question. Do children get upper respiratory tract infections when they're teething? So, really, there, theoretically, there's, there really sh shouldn't be a correlation there. Teething should not cause um, colds. But, you know, again, that's individually I've seen in different babies. I, I think it's probably more coincidental, but it, um, so teething itself should not cause a virus. Typically a cold, a, a common cold is a viral entity. Now, can te teething be potentially seem worse or can colds make teething worse? Um, I, I think it's hard to distinguish that, but teething itself generally doesn't cause a cold. That's usually a viral process. Okay. Just about every mom listening disagrees with uh, that, yes. probably. Yes. So uh, you know, they, 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 I don't think we, I don't know if we can change minds. <laughs> no, uh, but that's okay. You know, you're, you're gonna most of those cases, whether it be a cold or teething or a combination, you're gonna try the different different list of things, and uh, you know, just keep a close eye on the. When kiddo. when uh, is when do I as a young parent uh, and my child's teething when? When do I say, oh, this, this is, this, maybe this isn't, uh, or is there a time that I should say, I need to call Dr. Spellman, this doesn't seem right. Is there some warning signs for teething? Yeah, so, so you know, teething generally, if it's a mild intermittent irritability or it's the same time of day, you know, that, that would be probably more characteristic, characteristic with teething. Anytime they get a true fever, so 100.4 or above, uh, you know, that teething really shouldn't cause a, an actual fever. People describe sometimes like a low grade fever, so 99s up to around 100. But really, if you're if a baby's truly having a fever, there's something more going on. Okay, that's good um, advice. And then uh, more persistent irritability, and then just th things you can see: runny nose, um, you know, an older kiddo grabbing at the ears, uh, fussy, a big change in sleep acutely. So acute changes generally, I I recommend. Um, or acute symptoms, having somebody be looked at if they're getting worse. It's uh, that time of year when we're uh, pushing the flu shots. It's fall. Mm -hmm. um, can a teething baby, it's six months, right, that they get a flu shot? Yep. If they're six teething months. at six months, can they still get the flu shot? Absolutely. Okay, so even in their other vaccinations, teething doesn't influence that. No, and, and, and uh, no, it, it, I would say it actually, getting a flu shot, 
you know, you're looking at decreasing the risk of a lot of serious, serious illness and associated illnesses just beyond the flu. So, I mean, if you look at like ear infections and pneumonia and things like that, I mean, you know, flu, flu is to me is like a gateway to other illnesses. Yeah, yeah, it can absolutely. really put you at risk for beyond just the serious symptoms flu can cause. So definitely not a contraindication. I would say if you want to help, help a six month old or above potentially, um, avoid some major illnesses, the flu vaccine's a really good idea. And it is six months when you yep. start that. Yep, six months. And that's that's a pretty hard recommend hard, hard line recommendation. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, Dr. Spellman, this is great information. Uh, particularly, I, I feel like I've learned some things today. Uh, I'm Hopefully, uh, grandkids are a ways off, so I won't have to deal with any teething in our family for a while. Again, that was Dr. Luke Spellman, a pediatrician at UniPoint Clinic Pediatrics. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.